hit me. From Studio P in Sausalito, the home of the hit, it's time for... Suckatash. Yes, Suckatash, the comedy soundcast soundcast featuring snippets from comedy... Soundcasts. And also interviews with comedians, comedian soundcasters, and other showbiz folk. And now, here's your host, internationally recognized comedy soundcast soundcaster, Mark... Persia. Mark. Persia. Can you believe it? We're here again. You and I, I mean. I am, as our booth announcer Bill Haywatt just intoned, your every other weekly host, Mark Hersha. And you're obviously you. And this is Suckatash, the Comedy Soundcast Soundcast, episode 346 to be exact. And if this is your first visit, well, you already pretty much know what you need to know. We're just about a month away from celebrating this Soundcast's 12th anniversary. 12 years! Can you imagine? When Succotash started, the dodo birds were practically still alive, walking the still cooling surface of the primordial earth, stalking their favorite prey, the saber-toothed tigers. Ah. My esteemed co-host Tyson Saner and I were just conferring this past weekend about our upcoming show to commemorate the 12 years of Succotash and what we're going to do to celebrate... Some past guests and friends of the show are recording some salutations for us already, and we've discussed plans for what changes in the next season, our sixth season, and, you know, what might happen when that happens. If, by the way, you'd like to record a quick message with your thoughts or feelings on our 12th, we would love to get it and play it on the big celebration show. You can call it in to our Succotash show and runaway truck ramp hotline at 818-921-7212 or Record it and upload the WAVE or MP3 file to us at Hightail.com slash you slash Succotash. Well, that was easy to say. <laughs> Speaking of Tyson Saner, last week in this very same feed, he hosted episode 345 and brought along a special guest, comedian Josh Barnes. It was an interesting and funny chat with one of the members of the fairly exclusive circle of extreme Northern Californian comics based in Humboldt County. Check it out on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, YouTube, Amazon Music, Audible, iHeartRadio, PodBay, PodChaser, and, as always, on our home site at SuccotashShow.com. For this week's episode, entitled Clips Like a Lion, we get back to our more traditional clips from Comedy Soundcast formula with a little extra treat. I've got snippets from the show's Dear Chelsea, the J Train Podcast, and Two Vegan Idiots. <laughs> Plus, a contribution from comedian Dan St. Paul's Slices blog called Rebel Without a Phone. And we are sponsored, of course, by our longtime non pangs client, client, <laughs> sponsor, Henderson's Pants, and they're just in time for tax season accountant pants. That's pretty much the whole preamble I had in mind for this week's show. Let's get to the clips. Check this out. We first check in with comedian, author, and long-running TV show host Chelsea Handler and her soundcast, Dear Chelsea. This is a weekly advice show where Chelsea and what are usually her celebrity guests answer questions from listeners to the soundcast. Usually in a funny way, but sometimes she can really dig into the topics at hand and really get into it. I clipped a recent episode where she actually had two guests on, and their main claim to fame is that they're Chelsea's sisters, Shoshana and Simone. In this clip, they talk about how Sister Simone went from working in the healthcare industry to becoming a free-range ear piercer. And Shoshana has recently blossomed and burst into her own stage of womanhood, mm. right? With her personal business, which she's an ear piercer, a remote ear piercer, and she's a registered right. nurse. So you're getting a safe ear piercing when you, you can follow her on Instagram at piercings by Shoshana. Shana started her own business how long ago, Shana? Two years? One year? About a year ago. Okay. And it's thriving. I'm doing it for about four years. So yeah, it's a mobile concierge piercing service. We come right to your home and make it a safe, fun experience. Everyone gets a certificate of bravery for pictures. And it's just a really happy, fun way to do it that's comfortable and relaxed in your own home. And there's a huge market of little babies and little girls that are getting their ears pierced. I had no idea that so many people do this. Oh my gosh, yes. Every little girl in New Jersey. Yeah, and everybody I tell, they tell five or six friends. Do you do like birthday parties and stuff? I do. Sometimes I'm, I'm the actual president and the kid doesn't even know I'm coming, but she's been begging to get her ears pierced for months. And I walk in the door and they say, do you know who this is? 
she's going to pierce your ears. And then so I pop cute. out of the cake. <laughs> <laughs> topless. All the all, everyone in our family goes topless. It's not just me. Yeah, it's hereditary. <laughs> <laughs> My point of that story, Shauna, was that you were working in the medical industry, not medical industry. What, healthcare. Proper healthcare. You were a yeah. nurse. My sister was a nurse. And then she kind of got tired of that and... I guess the hours and the sense of responsibility. So you started your own business and I think it's given you a really big boon, right? Like a boost of self-confidence, of self-esteem. Tell us about that. Well, in a million years, I never thought I would own my own business. So it's been so much fun. I kind of fell into it because I started out with another company and then they ended up stopping the home piercings and there was such a huge demand. So Shoshana continued to moonlight. (laughs) that I thought, you know, (laughs) how can I keep doing this, you know, legitimately? And so I formed my own company and I love it. It's so rewarding and fun. Everybody I meet is so nice and they're so happy. It's such a happy occasion. Everything's good about it. And I love it. It's so cute because you're so much more social now. Like I never really thought of you as being super social, but you're out there like meeting new people all the time and they adore you. It's really cute. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I don't think... I ever had a problem being social or anything. I'm like more shy and quiet than you guys are, but I've always been good with patients and patient care in the hospital and all that. So it's just transferring it to the home. So for me, it's been easy, but I love it. Well, I think that pivot is really great for our listeners to hear because we have a ton of people who call in or write in and they're like, well, this is what I learned to do. This is what my career has been for the last 20 years. I can't really get out of it, especially when it's something really like you had to study for a long time for like healthcare, et cetera. And you pivoted into something where your background is super relevant, but it's definitely outside the box. And, you know, you got creative with it and look at you now. And both of them have had big life moves. Simone moved to San Francisco, like how many years ago, Moni? It's been like six and a half years, I guess. Yeah, from New Jersey. Her kids were getting older, and but she still had one kid in high school, my niece, Sunny. So she was deliberating whether or not to move out west, which was a huge culture shift, really. I mean, as far as a culture shift as you can get in like America, I guess Mississippi would be a bigger culture shift. But you know, and you kind of did change not careers, but in a in a way you did you changed what you were doing. Yeah, no, I mean, I think in my career, I've done a lot. I've had a lot of different jobs or different positions. But it's always been in healthcare law. And so I think as my kids were getting older, and I was divorced, and I was living in suburbia, and I was kind of just bored with living there and that whole routine of taking kids to soccer and baseball. And I didn't really find my people there where I was. And then I thought, you know, I really do need a change. So when I found this job in California, I was like, oh, I could I could totally live in San Francisco. Why couldn't I? The only big stumbling block was my daughter who was in high school and had to move her whole life here. But even for her, for her, it was probably a huge benefit as well. So it worked out, I don't know, for both of us. A change of venue, I think, is always good. Dear Chelsea is the name of the show, and you can find Chelsea Handler and her guests popping up on your favorite Soundcast distribution points every week. You can even send in your questions to Dear Chelsea Podcast. That's all run together, Dear Chelsea Podcast at gmail.com. The title of the next show we clip tells you pretty much all you need to know. Two Vegan Idiots is a Soundcast that features a pair of British comedians, Carl Donnelly and Julian Dean usually interviewing a comedian guest every episode. Or, as the show description reads, quote, Carl tries to interview them while Julian tries to get them canceled, (laughs) unquote. The vegan angle is true. They're both meatless eaters and tend to get a lot of ink from the vegan press. But it's really not the focus of their show since a lot of their guests seem to be omnivores. Their Epi 186 featured returning guest Eleanor Conway, and this snippet has them into the topics of orgasms, and also doing interviews on the street. I'm not sure how those come together, so to speak, which Eleanor famously does on British television. The interviewing on the street, not so much the orgasms. So that thing you're doing on the street, that's good, isn't it? Yeah, thanks. It's all right. What you, you want to talk about it? Let's talk about it. Yeah, that, yeah, I do. You, you, talk, you talk. I don't quite, know what you are. You talk about sex. I do. On the whole, I talk. Well, I basically link it in with my solo show, which is about like the like. The unpaid labour that working mothers, it sounds boring, but it's like, yeah, it's not. It's like just basically how things aren't equal when women have babies with straight men, the straight men, yes. and then the orgasm gap. So I just link in. Do you think they should have 
children with gay men. <laughs> this yeah, is, this I is do your actually. point. <laughs> All right, okay. This is a new theory. I've not heard this one. What's the um, orgasm gap? So straight women orgasm less than everybody else. Wait, women orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a sec. All right, Jamie, bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> what is this concept you speak of? <laughs> yeah, so I just go on the street and ask loads of questions. I did yeah, it in yeah. Edinburgh last What's year. What's the stats on this? I mean, not to get all like, um, I want to hear the point. <laughs> no, but, um, just, no, I'm not trying to, ch- I mean, like, what's the, um, you the know, numbers. is there a... Like, there is, what's actually. The, what is the disparity? Okay, so... Because we a men ejaculate, obviously, basically 100% like, of the time. <laughs> well, it's, 90, it's 95% of the time for straight men um, with their partners. It's 86, 86% for gay men coming with their partners. Oh, no, 89% would get for gay men, 86% for lesbians, and then for straight women, it's about 65%. Oh, you poor things. And it drops to 4% outside of a long-term relationship. Outside 4%. of a long term. Outside. Is that because women need to be mentally relaxed? No, it's because men men need to want to have you know, need to have a connection in order to want to make them come. Really? I that's think. that's what I mean. Like women need yeah, a, more yeah. a connection to come. No, men just no, the don't men, care. The men don't put the effort oh. in when it's just a sort of one mm. night thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So like women. I do. Uh, well, thank you for I'll your service. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I don't represent all men. Um, <laughs> Obviously. Um, right. So that is okay. That is. And, and what's and like um and like inside relationships. What, what was the that's percentage of men? Drunk and but stuff men, as well. men on not in long term relationships. Theirs is like high as shit. It's. I think it's about sixty percent. It's still quite oh, okay. high. Okay, but it's lower than men in relationships. Is that right? Yes. It really, is. I thought the single guys would be just jizzing everywhere. Where did you get these stats? There's a book about clits that I read. Oh, cool. What's the book called? Becoming Clitorate. It's a bit hard to find. Oh. <laughs> 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 oi, oi. Hello. Oi, always Went on. to the library to get it, couldn't bloody find it. <laughs> 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 oh, I wish I was fucking, I wish I could just do that joke on stage. It wouldn't suit me. It wouldn't be your brand. No, it wouldn't. Don't worry, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> So what? So what? When did you start? So when you started the videos, what was the first video you ever did? Well, I t- I went to America last year and did a couple out there, and they didn't really work. And then when I came ca- in Edinburgh, this well, that was year. the first time you got yeah, a camera out. Did yeah, you have a I, camera guy or your phone? Yeah, yeah, I hired someone. But like, I used to do it when I used to be a music journalist. I used to do that all the time. I used to go to gigs and or just it, stop people in the street, just people in the queue, yeah, festivals. Yeah. So it'd be, be part of that. So I just thought, oh, I've been seeing loads of young guys do it online. I reckon. I reckon I'd be better at, at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd, I'd be well. So I, I get, I'd be too nervous to approach strangers in the street and talk to really? them. Yeah, it's weird. I'm not very like, I don't know, not very socially confident. I, I think it's sort of that thing of just going up, hi guys, can I ask you a few questions? Yeah. In yeah. my head, I'd be like, oh, you're gonna, gonna knock me out. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's purely me. I'm not saying. Yeah, I, I wish I did have that sort of level of confidence. Have you ever had anyone just go fuck off? Um, <clears throat> no, no, no. They're just, they're just. You, you can kind of gauge, or if they're losing it in the middle of the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you just, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's or just they're an, boring as shit. I yeah, if they're boring as shit, I'll just wrap it up. I'll be yeah, like, yeah. okay, well, thanks, hope, bye, have a good night, bye, enjoy what? Magic Mike, bye, bye. And you do like ten a ten a night or something. Mm. We we'll just go out for a couple of hours. I started doing them at Edinburgh last year. I was having a horrible time. It was horrible, and I just thought, oh, do you know, I'll try these Vox Pops again, and yeah, and then a couple of clips were like got about half a million and. 200,000, you know, and I was like, oh, I might be onto something yeah, yeah, here. Yeah. I was like, I'm going to try. And then caught back from Edinburgh and I was just like, oh, that was horrible. It was the, honestly, it was the longest month and it was just, I was just so, just really horrible last year. What was, um, why? Just, it was a, it was a, a, it was just a slog. Tough. It because was the tough. Edinburgh Festival was on. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go when that's on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The rest of the year is a lovely city. <laughs> I don't think you have to give up meat to enjoy the two vegan idiots, which you can find across the web. If you have difficulties looking it up, though, remember you can always head over to our home site, SuccotashShow.com, and find show links plus social media hookups for the hosts and their guests in the blog entry for every show we feature. We are going to pause for a moment for this important announcement from our fake sponsor about the smartest pair of pants you may ever own. Trusted friends, are you part of the 99%? With tax season just around the corner, there's no better time to hitch up your britches and occupy a pair of Henderson's accountant's pants. Created by Henderson's Pants CFO Samuel Grifter to keep track of the company's then meager finances right after the stock market crash of 1929, these trousers have a series of interlocking rear pockets made for storing and sorting receipts, invoices, and financial records of every kind. 
perfect for day-to-day -day purchases as well as those one-time big-ticket items. Just pop the paperwork in the patented paper pusher in the back of every pair of Henderson's accountant's pants, and it is tucked away in the correct pocket every time. And these pants aren't just for keeping receipts in your seat. While you're taking care of business in the back, our deep pockets in the front are roomy enough to move all your money out of those giant banks and keep that folding green close to home. While there's no accounting for taste, you'll be cooking the books in style with your Henderson's accountant's pants. These trousers may be expensive, but even if you end up breaking the bank to buy a pair, they're made to tighten your belt automatically. And when tax time rolls around, there are no more forms to fill out. Just drop trow and send your Henderson's accountant's pants to the IRS. From now on, instead of giving Uncle Sam the shirt off your back, you can give him the pants right off your ass. Originally designed for Black Friday, Bernie Madoff, and national bankers who have trouble keeping their pants on, Henderson's accountant's pants are available wherever the 1% are making a mockery of capitalism. That's Henderson's, makers of fine trousers and pantaloons since 1783. And now back to Sockatash. Jared Freed is a New York-based comedian whose act focuses a lot on dating and relationships. His soundcast, The J Train Podcast, shares a similar focus where he and his comedian guests answer listener emails and get into conversation about the dating life, but other things too. Our clip hails from last month in an episode entitled Would You Expose a Cheater? with guest Ashley Hamilton. She's co-host of the Celebrity Memoirs podcast, and Celebrity Memoirs is what they're kicking around in this clip. Who can you name off the top of your head that you're like, this person has a memoir? Like, memoir, I think of, like, political people and, you know, thought leaders. I, I, like, who yeah. has memoirs? I mean, everyone now. It's insane. Every I mean, if you've watched Selling Sunset, we've done Chris L. Stouse and Christine Quinn from Selling Sunset, and it's just, why, why would they have a memoir? I don't know, but they do, and I've read them. Um, there's what are so they many saying? random people. Like, what is Chris Shell? And I know she has a story where she, I think she was homeless at one point. Like, yeah, her story I feel like could have actually been kind of interesting, but she didn't. Whoever her ghostwriter was did not write it that way. It really was just like, I don't know. My family, our house burnt down, but now I. And then I was on a soap opera, so that's cool. <laughs> and you're like, okay. But how many pages is that book? Like, how do they stretch it? Like, you know, I, I guess my question is like, you know, like it, 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 the selling sunset, Chris Shell, which yeah. she, her whole thing was that I was homeless. Like, I, I, that's all I know about. It. I don't even watch the show. And I yeah. know that, which is a Hers? hard, you go, but you go, okay, that's her, that, this, this is why she's a, you know, a top sales woman, salesperson, like, but then to not talk about it in the book, like. Yeah, it's, I mean, she mentions it, but it doesn't feel like that. I don't know. She doesn't really draw it out. She just like kind of tells you the bullet points of what her childhood was like. And then. I don't, that book is really interesting because it's like the same ghostwriter who I recognize from a lot of the more like frivolous, like just shoot this off memoirs. Mm. And she does this thing where she like bullet points at the end of every chapter. And then there's these other listicles throughout. So how they draw it out is by making almost none of it writing. It's all right. just like bullet points. And like there's like a probably a Sudoku in some of them. I don't really know. Right. what is happening and like even the more legit celebrities like Anna Kendrick wrote a memoir when she was like 28 or something and you're just like but why right I guess it so my assumption is a twofold why one yeah. book the book industry is in trouble and they need something that will sell and they need something on I, I tell me if I'm wrong this is my assumption yeah. please that they want someone on the cover that makes someone buy a book and I would say the other part of it is that it's easy money for these celebrities. Is that what it is? I think so. I also suspect that a lot of them are like, I don't know, you become a celebrity because you think quite highly of yourself. So I feel like if someone suggests to you, like, do you think you should write a book? They're like, of course I should. Who better to write a book than me? <laughs> and you're like, right. I guess a lot of people, but. That's like the like, opposite answer that I would give. Right? Oh, like, yeah. Don't you think I, I because I'm I agree with you. I would think, oh, their first answer is, oh, of course, the the world needs to hear my tale. Yeah. Um, but I also 
do you think any of them are like no and they're like it's a million dollars like all you have to do is say yes and never like i do you think they never read their own books yes i don't think a lot of them read their own books but also (laughs) i do i don't know how many of them like have the self-awareness to be like no i shouldn't tell my story at this time do you know what I, right. the things that they come out with? I'm like, I don't think that that is a thought process. I don't well, think any of them are like, well, let me wait until I really experience some things. They'll all like Christine Quinn's book is very like, here's how you can be as successful as me, someone who's on a reality show. And you're like, OK, I don't know that this is like applicable advice. Right. I I it's it's fascinating. Well, other than, cele- you know, reality show people like who else? Who had the craziest book that maybe someone should go read? Um, I mean, some of them are really interesting or I mean, yeah, we read more than just reality people. But I'm trying to think like Will Smith's was a fun one that I always think about just because he really is like when people are like, who is the kind of person that becomes an A-list movie star? It's Will Smith. I feel like whenever we have these right. stories about like Will Smith or Tom Cruise or someone like that, like being kind of a looney tune, everyone is just like but how? And it's like, well, that's why they're as successful as they are. It's not like there is a number one action hero in this world who isn't like insane. If Jared sounds familiar, you might know him from another relationship based soundcast, You Up, or it's got a question mark. So I guess that would be You Up, that he co-hosts with Betch's co-founder, Jordana Abraham. But that clip was from the J Train podcast, which you can find on all major soundcast distribution nodes on the interwebs. That's it for our clips this episode, but as I said, we have a treat in store. Regular listeners to this show may remember that I featured several comedy blog pieces turned audio musings from comedian and friend of the show Dan St. Paul. These were contributions to his regular blog, Slices, and I played around by adding some a music bed and some sound effects, and Dan really liked it. He picked up the ball and is now doing that himself with the aid of Jimmy Goings. So we'll keep featuring them when they come in, and here's one of his latest essays entitled Rebel without a phone. I noticed three shiny spots on the windshield of my 2002 Prius. No, that's not a typo. Not 2020. I drive a 2002 Prius that I bought for $3,500 four years ago. It only has 120,000 miles on it and it gets 39.5 miles per gallon. That's right. I'm not only cheap, I brag about it, but I digress. I thought the spots were tree sap. They turned out to be small dents. Days later, a foot-long crack developed on the passenger side. That night, I suffered a horrifying dream. While I sped along the highway, my windshield burst into sharp, deadly pieces. Glass shards repeatedly attacked my eyes. Screaming, I slammed on the brakes, causing an eight-car pileup with no survivors. I woke up and checked my eyes and feverishly scheduled a new windshield to be installed at the nearest shop immediately. I accepted the soonest appointment they had available in 10 days. A week out, I received an appointment email and text reminder. Three days later, I received another. Thereafter, they contacted me daily. Obviously, my business was very important to them. I wondered if they were going to dispatch a police escort to make sure I showed up on time. Turns out, I wish they had. I took off at 1.40 p.m. for my 2 o'clock appointment. I figured the shop was less than 20 minutes away. Halfway there, I discovered I left my phone at home. No problem. I had glanced at a map. I was pretty sure I knew where I was going. So I took off without my phone, and as I drove down the cross street, I passed where I thought the address would be. I was lost. It wasn't on Chestnut Street because there was no Chestnut Street. I I figured I'd pull over and check my iPad, which I had brought along to pass the time during the installation. I hoped that the same map was the last location I checked on the map app. Otherwise, I needed an internet connection to look it up. I reached for my glasses. I checked my pocket, my backpack, the side console, the glove compartment. No glasses. 
two o'clock came and went and I was approaching panic. They're expecting me. This is the day. They alerted me countless times. I can't be late. What will this say about me? I detest people who are late. I had a co-worker who was consistently tardy for years. It feels demeaning. When you are late, you are saying, whatever I was doing is more important than whatever we are doing. I am not that person, and I don't want anyone to think that I am that person. I spotted a branch of my bank. I parked and checked the map. No luck. The destination was no longer on the screen. I, I rushed in without a mask. Damn it. I went to the car and got a mask. I stood outside the building, iPad between my knees, applying my mask. Upon entry, I noticed the place was almost empty. Hello? No one at the many desks of this cavernous office. It looked abandoned, except for three tellers. I impatiently stood in line to wait my turn. A good three minutes later, I reached a window and explained my predicament. Before I could ask for the Wi-Fi password, the kind sir gave me directions to Chestnut Street. I reached the corner of Broadway and Chestnut Street and made a left when I should have made a right. I got to the dead end and then performed an illegal U-turn and raced up the other direction. I was easily 15 minutes late and seriously thinking about just returning home and profusely apologizing over the phone when I spotted the shop a block away. It clicked that I had viewed the map from the wrong perspective, placing the address closer than further. It was a good quarter mile away from where I had figured. As I pulled in, a car was backing out of one of the work bays. A young, smiling, uniformed gentleman motioned me in to take its place. I leapt out of the car to beg his forgiveness, but before I could speak, he joyously proclaimed... Right on time. Whew. You can check Dan St. Paul and more of his essays out at Dan St. Paul. That's all uh, one word, sort of Dan, D-A-N-S-T-P-A-U-L dot substack dot com, as well as at comedy venues around the San Francisco Bay Area where he's been headlining for years. That's going to do it for our regularly scheduled content for this episode. It's been a few weeks since we've checked into the tweet sack, hey Tweety, and run down the list of fine folks who've mentioned us in our at Succotash, at Succotash show handle in their socials on Twitter and Instagram. So let's do it. John Dredge. My neighbors are dead. The Jock Doc Podcast. Ray Christian. Salty Language Podcast. Hunter Block. Dave in the Cave, Amonis Franco, Tom Jr. Jackson, Josh Gilliland, recent guest, Gabriel Diani, brother of recent guest, Rick Digman, John Hokim, Monica Homburg, Lily Holloman, Mama Cow Creations, that's my sister Elise, hi Elise, Stoney Burks, and the Let's Chat Podcast. Thanks for the mentions, gang. I'm going to get the heck out of here. Remember that Tyson Saner will be here next week with episode 347 for you. He and I, as I said, are planning the big upcoming 12th anniversary show and do not be shy about sending in a note or a recording salutation for the occasion. You can even do it via Twitter or Instagram by just using our at Succotash show handle. And if you're ever lying in the sand on a beach in a tropical island and some bully kicks sand in your face to get your attention because you've got your earbuds in and he asks, have you heard anything good lately? Won't you please pass the succotash? You've been listening to Succotash, the comedy soundcast soundcast with your host, Mark Hershaw. Brought to you by Henderson's Pants and... Imagine your company's name right here. Rate us and review us at Apple and Google Podcasts. Find us on the web at SuccotashShow.com. On Spotify. On Stitcher. On iHeartRadio. On YouTube. On SoundCloud. And wherever fine soundcasts are streamed and 
or download it. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Succotash Show. Like us on Facebook. Email us at marc at succotashshow.com. Or call into the Succotash Skype line at our toll call number 818-921-7212. You can also upload clips from your favorite comedy soundcasts directly to us using our direct upload link at hightail.com slash you slash Succotash. Succotash is produced and engineered by Joe Paulino through the auspices of Studio P. Sausalito, the home of the hit. Our hosts are Mark Hershon and Tyson Sainer. Our musical director is Scott Carvey. Our booth assistant is Kenny Durges. Succotash is executive produced by Mark Hershon. Until next time, I'm your loyal booth announcer, Bill Haywatt, reminding you to please pass the Succotash goodbye. This has been a Succotash Patch production.